What is my table? I mean, it's a table, but like, what is it made from? It's made of wood and metal. There's a plastic sticker underneath it. These materials being more universal seem to be more real than my table, which really isn't much more than a shape, one specific combination of wood and metal and plastic. So really, it's the wood and metal and plastic that exists, not the table. But then, what is wood and metal? Things are made of smaller things, which are made of yet smaller things. So are the smaller things. So are smaller things just made of smaller and smaller things? I'm really confused, and I'm kind of scared to ask at this point. There seem to be two different kinds of objects. Complex objects composed of smaller parts, and simple objects that make up the complex objects. We deal with complex objects all the time, but what is a simple object? I think it's something like an atom, but what do I mean by that? A simple object must be indivisible, because otherwise it would be composed of smaller parts, and thus it wouldn't be simple. It must be indestructible, because to destroy something only means to rearrange its component parts. It must be eternal, because it can't be created or destroyed, because to create or destroy something generally only means to rearrange its component parts. So what is wood and metal? I suppose they must be composed of the simple objects, but then what are the simple objects? My body is made of muscles, which is made from tissues, which is made from cells, which is made from molecules, which are made from atoms. Everything is made of atoms. Metals, plastic, woods, and hands. For most practical purposes, it's totally fine to stop here. In fact, atoms as an idea was proposed as the solution to the very question at hand. What are the simple objects? This question goes back to the ancient Greeks and is generally credited to Democritus and before him Leucippus, who both posited that all matter must be composed of a basic simple unit. They called it atomos, which is Greek for uncuttable. That is, it isn't made of smaller parts. It is the base reality. Immediately there is a discrepancy between how the ancient Greeks used the term atom and how we use it. Today we know that atoms are made of smaller parts, they're composed of protons and neutrons and electrons, and we know they're divisible. Really the only reason we keep calling them atoms is by convention. By the time we were studying these, modern chemistry had really started taking off and names stick, but these atoms aren't atoms in the Greek sense. What about protons and neutrons and electrons then? They seem pretty simple. Electrons might be, but Protons are made from quarks, and so are neutrons. Really what the Greeks meant by atoms is more in line with what we mean by subatomic particles. Supposedly it doesn't get smaller than this. So these are the simple objects. These muons and quarks and neutrinos. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure there aren't smaller objects than these, but I'm not sure how I'm supposed to think of these. I'm not even sure it makes sense to conceptualize them as objects. In my classes, it's always sort of assumed that they're tiny particles. It's even in the name, subatomic particles. But what is a particle? I think it's something like a speck, a dot, a tiny corpsicle of something, but nonetheless something existing in space, an object with extension. It can't be a speck. A speck is a ball. When I zoom in close to it, it's a tiny round planet, which is a problem because I can cut those in half, and therefore it's not simple. The halves must be the simple objects, but I can just cut the halves in half, and on and on forever. A simple object can't have volume. It can't be extended in space, because if it is, part of it exists at one point in space, and another part exists at some other point in space, which means there's space in between that, which means it can be divided, not a simple object. The only conclusion is that simple objects don't have volume, and instead occupy singular points in space. Points that can be infinitely zoomed into, yet never arrived at. They can't be extended, or the whole idea breaks down. But that creates an even bigger problem, because the complex objects before me are extended in space. They do take up a definite volume. The desk before me is three feet high, two feet across. It occupies a space in my room, and yet it is composed of volumeless simples? The ten trillion simple objects making up my desk can't give it volume, because they don't have any volume to give. They have zero volume, and there may be ten trillion of them, but zero plus zero plus zero is still zero, no matter how many there are. Maybe my desk just appears to have volume? Maybe it isn't actually solid at all. Maybe the simples affect one another without touching each other in space, but by some kind of psychic communication between simples. Actually, I'm pretty sure that part is true. Subatomic particles don't push each other around like billiard balls smacking into one another but by emitting and receiving information in the form of force-conveying particles. Photons, WZ bosons, gluons. But how does a volumeless particle emit a boson? To emit means to produce it from inside, but they can't have an inside 
if they're volumeless. Maybe they're not particles at all. I know that in some sense they're supposed to be waves. Waves of what though? I know they can't be waves extended in space because that wouldn't solve my problem. I can still cut them halfway down the wavelength. I don't think they can be extended in time either, for the same reason, just on the separate axis. When I solve for the wave function, I notice that they're not just functions of space, they're functions of time, which creates an entirely separate issue. Actually, I think the wave function is the square root of the probability of finding a particle at a specific point in space and time with a specific momentum. But then I still have a particle. I still have a speck. It doesn't solve the problem. It just gives me a probability of whether or not I'll have a problem to solve. Some friends I know told me the question actually starts to break down at the quantum scale, where the Planck length is the smallest distance for which it's meaningful to say anything about. And I was comforted by that for a second, but I don't see how that's better because I can just cut the Planck length in half. I can divide it by two. I can do this on my whiteboard. No, no, it's not meaningful to speak of smaller distances. Why isn't it? I've heard that the Planck length is the pixel scale of reality, which makes sense in that it describes a discrete scale for space-time, but you know, pixels are just tiny squares, and you can cut squares in half. It's either an incomplete analogy, or the statement, it's nonsensical to speak of smaller distances, is simply false. Don't pixels presuppose continuous space underneath them? I mean, what else is a pixel but a tiny square existing in a continuum? The Planck length is also the scale where the strength of gravity, the weakest of the four fundamental forces, becomes comparable to the rest of the four fundamental forces. These are the conditions for strange phenomena like quantum foam and microscopic black holes. The Planck scale is associated with the smallest Schwarzschild radius, the radius of the area where the energy necessary to measure anything would immediately collapse into a black hole. Any attempt to measure a distance smaller than the Planck length would create a black hole one Planck length across. But that's not the same as saying smaller distances aren't real. Just because the microscope I'm using fogs up the image doesn't mean that I can't speak about the image. I can still think about it, and I can still speak meaningfully about it. So I'm not totally satisfied by that. I think there probably are smaller distances. If there are smaller and smaller distances, though, there can't be particles. And if there can't be particles, there can't be solid objects. I'm very confused. I'm starting not to believe in solid matter. I think I've been living in some kind of spirit realm without realizing it. Religions are for stupid people, but I definitely do believe in spirits, at least in some sense. These things in my room don't seem to make sense as solid objects, so I guess they make sense as ideas. My soul certainly seems different from stone. I think basically everyone thinks that part, including atheists, and I don't think it makes them any less of an atheist. The conscious part of me is spirit, or at least it can't be extended in space. It doesn't have mass. I mean, I don't weigh less after I die. I guess my desk is a spirit. That would explain the paradox. While I'm editing this video, I've come to this stupid realization that this is all very similar to an idea that Leibniz had. Uh, I don't really like Leibniz, but now I suppose I have to go read Leibniz, as well as my particle physics textbook, as well as probably a lot of other things. I'm getting that feeling I get when I know how to solve a problem, I just know it'll take a year, so I might turn this into a series. None of my questions are in any way rhetorical, and if anyone watching has any idea about the nature of the simple objects, please leave a comment because I'm genuinely confused and deeply dissatisfied with my conclusion. Anyways, like, subscribe, and I hope you enjoy the rest of 2023. Thank you.